there's no safe time. There's no time when all will be well and everything will be settled because just as you think you're getting it together, you begin thinking, well, should I retire or should I have another baby or should I move to another city? And you start raising questions again about who you are, where you're going, uh, these kinds of identity issues that you had when you were an adolescent. Welcome to this edition of Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville's Open Campus and our Women's Center. I'm Dr. Charles DeSance, provost of the Kent campus of FCCJ, and I'm privileged to be the host for this program. We have a very interesting and informative guest for you today, Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Dr. Schlossberg is a noted expert in the United States on the issue of adult development and adult learning. What she has to share, I think you'll find very, very interesting and informative, and I think very, very helpful, too. Dr. Schlossberg is currently a professor at the University of Maryland at College Park, where, in addition to her teaching, she continues to do research and writing in the field of adult development. She has many, many books, monographs, and journal articles to her credit and has been honored by such groups as the American Psychological Association and the American College Personnel Association, among many others. As I say, I think you'll find this an interesting program, this, and we're going to be talking about adult development. Dr. Schlossberg, very happy to have you with Thank us today. You. Um, I guess it's only the last 25 or 30 years, particularly, that the whole area of adult development has become so popular in this country, and I guess all over the world. What, uh, what do you attribute that to, and, and what, what kind of things are people saying now about the adult development? What, why is it so important to us? Well, first of all, 25 years ago, uh, it was just you could become an instant expert on adult development. In my first research study that I published on adult men changing careers, I went to the library. It took me a half a day to find all the references. Well, today, it's just overwhelming. I mean, the field is just grown by leaps and bounds. First of all, we're living longer. People are living longer, so the adult years are important to look at. But you ask, what are we saying about the adult years? And, and I think it's interesting. There's conflicting evidence about these adult years. You're an adult, I take it. Is yes. that right? That's, I mean, that's you are. right. Okay. That's right. Um, you've got people on one side talking about stage theory, saying that during the adult years, people go through stages just like young people do young adult years and then the middle adult and old age and so forth and that there are these passages and stages and steps that you go and that you can sort of predict what will happen next. So that's on one, one group of researchers and they're very good researchers. Then there are another group at the other end of the continuum who say life is full of surprises. We don't know what age we're going to marry, divorce, have babies. We cannot predict the stages that we will go through. And they are not stage theorists. In fact, they say if they were to use, to label themselves, they talk about variability. That there's such variability during the adult years that you can't classify them on these sort of steps and stages. So the field is not, I mean, there's no consistency yet in the field. Okay. So on the one hand, I know many people have, have read some popular books like Passages right. and Seasons of a Man's Life. Right which kind of imply a stage that adults go through. Um, why do I feel like you're on the other side of that continuum? Oh, are you clever? <laughs> well, I really am. First of all, I'm a great admirer of Daniel Levinson, who wrote Seasons of a Man's Life. I have my students read Seasons of a Man's Life. Um, I think he's a brilliant, brilliant person. I have disagreed with him publicly about the stage theory, about the age grading theory, that he attaches things on the basis of interviews with 40 men, and now I don't know how many women, but he has a new book coming out, uh, that there are too few people he's interviewed uh, to be able to generalize and say 
this is what happens when you're 30, 40, 50. I am on the other side because, um, and so are people like Bernice Newgarten. If, chick, if you have a group, say, of all 40-year-old men and women, what have you told me about them? You've told me nothing except they're 40. But if you say, this one was dumped by a husband, this one was just promoted, this one has just been fired, this, is, this has happened to this person. If you start giving me kind of the context of their lives, the transitions they've gone through, it becomes, I begin a richer understanding because somebody at 40 who's been dumped is not the same as somebody who's just been promoted. Yeah. In fact, uh, USA Today called me to interview me once for their magazine, and they wanted to know several well-known women were about to be 60. Jacqueline, uh, Onassis, um, I forget who else. What did I, what did I have to say about 60-year-old women? I said, nothing. I have nothing to say. I said, if you're Barbara Bush and you're 60 and you're married to a president and you have a hairdresser who will come to the house and you've got, uh, you know, all these services, that's different than if you're 60 and you've just been dumped by a husband and you're a single parent and you've been abused and you have no money. So telling me about 60 doesn't tell me anything. That makes a great deal of sense. Uh, it's a very individualistic kind of approach as to how we face these things that happen to us throughout our lives. Um, it seems a lot of people grew up with the notion, I think a fa obviously a false one, when uh, they were very small, that when you got to adulthood, everything kind of smoothed out. Yes. It was only adolescents that were the ups and downs. Right. Um, we sure know that's not true. And we, we do. There, and you know, there's no safe time. There's no time when all will be well and everything will be settled because just as you think you're getting it together, you begin thinking, well, should I retire or should I have another baby or should I move to another city? And you start raising questions again about who you are, where you're going, uh, these kinds of identity issues that you had when you were an adolescent. Mm -hmm. It never stops, unfortunately. I guess that, that's a good news and bad news, potentially. What, um, I know in your, some of your writing, you refer to these things that occur in our lives as, as transitions, right. periods of transition. What, could you talk a little bit about, about what you mean by transitions, and are there different kinds? Right. Uh, well, the d way I define a transition is that it is an event. Well, that's like a job change, retirement, any kind of change. A, a transition is an event or a non-event. That is, not having a promotion, not publishing a book, not having the baby that you wanted. So a transition is an event or non-event that alters your life. It really changes your life. So you could have 10 people around the same transition. It would look like they're having the same transition. They've all been, um, they've all just moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. But is that the same transition? Absolutely not. For some people, they are moving home to an area which is home, where they have friends and families. Other people are moving to a strange area. Some people are moving because the person's initiated it. Somebody else, the partner or spouse, maybe is the follower. So the apparently same transition moving to Jacksonville is very, very different. And you have to look at everybody who's moving to Jacksonville and say, let's look at how this move which is an event, has altered your roles, your relationships, your routines, and the way you see yourself. Mm. I, I want to come back at some, I hope we have time in the program to talk about non, do you call them non-events? Right. Uh, yeah. that, that fascinates me, but I want to stay with this, with the transition okay. kind of okay. idea right now for a second, All I guess. Right. Um, so we have these very, very ki different kinds of things that are maybe the same thing happening to people, but obviously we react very differently. It sounds almost, it's almost kind of overwhelming, um, you know, to know how, how, do you, how do you cope with those things? Well, what I've tried to do in my work uh, is to look and develop a system for understanding any transition in your life. It doesn't take the misery out of change, but it takes some of the mystery out. So how can you get a handle on change? Because all of us are going through lots of different changes. And we don't react the same way to every change. And maybe we reacted well to a move 10 years ago, and now we're really falling apart at the prospect of a move. Or maybe we didn't do well 10 years ago, but the prospect of a new move is very exciting. So what makes the difference? How can we get a handle on it? And how can we understand it 
that's what my work has been about. And I don't know how detailed you want me to get. Um, well, I think it might help our viewers if they had some sense that there is a program that they might, you know, that, that might be helpful. Could, right. Maybe could you talk about that a second? If, I, if I'm facing a major transition in my life or any transition, um, well, how do I think about it? Well, you read my book. Well, that's a good idea. Uh, we, ought to, we ought to put that up and, sh <laughs> and show people that okay. uh, your most recent book, which is uh, I have read, as a matter of fact, and is a very, very good one. Um, and we'll talk a bit, uh, maybe a bit about that toward the end of the program, too, in All case right. people would like to, like to go out and buy that. I'll just say the name of it because so people uh, might think about it. Because the, the name, I think, signifies some of what we're talking about. It's overwhelmed coping with life's ups and downs. In other words, you can be overwhelmed even with an up. You get promoted, and it can be overwhelming. You get fired, it can be overwhelming. So overwhelmed, coping with life's ups and downs. And the nice thing about the book, it's in hardback, Lexington Press, but it's also been bought by Dell, and it's a small paperback. Great. So, and that you can get in any bookstore. But at any rate, the point of writing the book was to help people look at change in their lives and get a handle on it. So the first thing you do, the book is divided into three parts, really. Approaching change, taking stock of your resources for coping, and then taking charge. Mm. Approaching change is to understand the kind of change you're having. Is it an event? Is it a non-event? Is it something you want? Is it something you don't want? Is it something you initiated or happened to you? It's quite different to change jobs because the handwriting is on the wall and you better get out than changing jobs because you want a new experience. Yes. So you approach change, you, you look at the type of change. You then look at how it changes your life, which we talked about before. You look at where you are. Is this something you're thinking about? Has it just happened? Is it happening, did it happen two years ago? Uh, your reactions to the change will vary. So sometimes when you're in the midst of a new experience, you're overwhelmed. But just keep in mind that today is not forever that in fact your reactions will change. So it's just this first part of the book is to get you in touch with change and how it isn't the label retirement or career change or having a baby, it's how much it changes your life and where you are in the process. Is that part of what you mean by taking the mystery out of the process? Yes. So look at the change and the different types of change and whether they happen to you or to your partner or your, to your children or to your parents and then ripple onto you. The second part of the book is, okay, let's, all right, I'm having this change, so what? I understand all that, now what? Well, each one of us has potential resources for coping with change. And I call them the four S's. So that you can look at this change, let's say a job change, okay. and you can look at your resources for coping. Your first S is to look at is your situation. Is this a change you, you control, or is it something that happened to you? Is this at a good time in your life, or at a bad time? Are there lots of other stresses going on in your life? You've just been divorced, you're, uh, you have a sick child, you know, what, what else is going on in your life? So you can look at your situation. Is that a plus or a minus as you face this change? You can then look at your support system at home, at the office, in the community. Do you have more support or more sabotage? Do you have more help or less help? So is that a strength for you? What about your third S is yourself? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Can you deal with ambiguity or do you have to have everything in neat packages? And your fourth is, uh, do you use a lot of strategies flexibly? Now, that's very simply the four S's, so mm -hmm. that you can look at this change. Let's take a job change. There was the story of the woman who uh, said, I can make a change. I want to leave my job. I'm an optimist. I've got terrific support. My situation is great. I've educated my children. I can take a risk. Somebody else cannot take a risk kids in college, uh, they have a very unsupportive family situation, they don't have benefits, uh, they have to be careful. I mean, there are, you look at these, your situation, self-supports, and you begin to assess where my strengths are as I face transition and where my deficits are. And then the third part is you take 
your deficits and say, gee, what's weak for me is my support system, or what's weak for me is my situation, or myself, and then you can look at the strategies you have at your disposal and say, well, see, let me back up and say that coping strategies come in four types. They're the strategies that we use to change a situation, like assertiveness, uh, legal action, negotiation. There are another set of strategies where we try to change the meaning of the situation. A third where we jog and meditate and manage our reactions to stress, and the fourth is do nothing. So let's say you want to make a change in your job. You want to move to another city, and you have a wife and some children. Now, the job offer is terrific. You're ready. It's at a good, your situation is a good time in your life. Let's say your wife is finishing her degree, and it would be a terrible time. And let us say your daughter is going into senior year in high school. So your situation isn't so clear, is it? It's, no, it's very sorry. ambiguous about whether that's a plus or a minus. Now let's look at supports and realize that in this old job that you're thinking of leaving, you have fantastic support system. Your family is here. You move to the new place, you don't know anybody, and you don't know what the supports will be. But we come to you, yourself, and you're able to deal with ambiguity, you are an optimist, and so then you begin to look at this and to say, well, should I make the move or not? You know, people say to me, should I move to Florida? I'm retiring. How do I know? Look at your four S's. Yeah. But then the last part of the model is what to do about it. So we've got these four strategies, and let's suppose everything is in order but your support system. So you can say, oh, do I want to change my support and get more supports? Maybe I'll go to a therapist. Maybe I'll make some other friends. Maybe I'll start going to that new city and join a church or a community group and start building my supports. So you can say, yeah. Or do you want to change the meaning of supports and say, all right, I won't have a great support system in the new situation, but I know that's temporary and I'm going to relax about it and not give myself a hard time on it. Is this what happens to some people who maybe make a change, a job change, or change uh, partners or whatever, um, and then have a sense of being sort of depressed and down and can't understand uh, you know, why it was a good change? They wanted to make it, and yet they don't feel good about it. Uh, because whenever everything has changed, your roles, relationships, routines, assumptions, it is very stressful. And it's very difficult. And especially when it's a change you want it. You know, you're going to make this job change, and you don't feel great. You're a little depressed. But why wouldn't you be depressed a little bit if you've left a terrific support system, if you've disrupted your family life? Let's suppose the scenario I suggested is really true and you've moved ahead anyway and the family is moved and even though it's a terrific new job and you're head of the world or whatever you want to be head of the family is in crisis mm -hmm. or let's suppose you move and it takes a while you don't have that network yet the new network and it takes a while to build those bridges but if you have assessed all those things and and made a a conscious decision that we'll do this and uh, that's the part again of taking the mystery out so you know what's going to happen and it may still feel miserable for a time but you know what's happening and it's going to perhaps get better when uh, the support system is strong again or whatever. Is right. That, is that? I think so. There is a computer-based program by the way. Uh, the American College Testing Service has a, a series of computer-based guidance programs called Discover. Oh. And they have a Discover, it's their career planning, and they right. have a Discover for uh, high school, for college students, for adults, and now a new one for pre-retirement. Well, on, in the one for adults, they have a module called Weathering Change, and it's based on the transition model, and it really is cute because, I mean, I can say it's cute. I didn't do it. They did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a thermometer. So you type in your transition. And then you take your temperature. You go through the four S's. And if the situation isn't good, then your temperature goes up. If your supports are good, your temperature is normal. If your self is, you know, so yeah. you, and you get a reading on each. And Just then a you graphic get a, way to look at this. Yeah, and then you get an overall temperature. But you can begin to see, well, I've got to bring my temperature down here. And I've got to, uh, you know, do something about this. And you graphically see mm -hmm. that you can weather change by assessing uh, what goes into making your, your potential resources for coping. 
it's, um, let me say this about it, it's very rational. So somebody who's much more intuitive and mystical might say, well, how, how would this apply to me? You know, actually, as I was writing the book, I'm thinking, when I read this book, I mean, would I be helped? Good question to ask. Yes, would I be helped by this book? <laughs> and then I wrote in the book at some point that it's like dancing. Dancing is fun. I think it's fun. Yeah. But you can't really dance and improvise until you know the basic steps. And what this book does is try to give the basic steps. And of course, you're going to improvise. And it gives a structure. It gives a way of looking at change. So, and there are two basic things. This happened to me. How can I weather it? Or should I make the change? Should I move to Florida? Should I move wherever I'm moving? Should I change jobs or partners? And it gives you a way to, to look at it to assess it, mm -hmm. see where you are. That would seem to be very, very helpful to, to all of us who are facing transitions. Uh, th some people I, I suspect, I don't know who I've talked to, and I expect you have too, uh, even when ha have trouble um, maybe even knowing how to go about getting help with, uh, with uh, so suppose they're stuck on a transition. You know, what, what are the kind of things they might do to, uh, where, where are the places they might go to look for some help? Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, which is a popular book as opposed to a professional book, a textbook, and I've written textbooks about transitions, is that in my work of training counselors, I realized that so many people in need of help don't want to go to a therapist or a counselor or don't go and that all through life we're going to face a lot of transitions and need some help. So the self-help book is not meant to be instead of counseling or therapy. It can be in addition to it or instead of for those people who don't want to go to another person for help. And so what I try to do is say, okay, for some people, reading and using a self-help book is the answer. Yes, yeah. But for others, obviously going to a community college. Uh, every community college, well, you, you know this better than I, is this true what I'm going to say, that every community college has a counseling center? Yeah, I think that's I, I probably would think a true statement. And deal with lots and lots of people who are making transitions. Lots of people come to community colleges when they're at a transition point in their right. lives. Right. Even people who are not enrolled in the community <coughs> college. Is that not also that's correct? That's true. That these career centers and counseling centers do help people in the community. That's right. It seems to me that the community college is a very easy place to go to. Uh, there are lots of groups being run, individual therapy, individual counseling, referral possibilities. But still, for those people who aren't willing to do that, that's, you know, here's a book that might also encourage you to later do it. But I would think, when you say, how do you get help with transitions, that I think there are lots of books out. There are lots of books other than my book that are very helpful, I think, to people. Well, this, then your particular book may help someone know that they do, in fact, need some other kind, some additional kind of help. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've sorted all this out, and now I know I really need to spend some time with a counselor right. to figure out what's going on with me in this case. Uh, and the other thing, let's suppose that you're vulnerable as is self. Yeah. Well, in my chapter on self, I have references to books that deal with optimism. So that might give somebody an idea, well, maybe I should go get that book or uh, there are books on, on various topics that I reference in my work on transitions, on uh, other people have written, I would say a lot more on the transition process, not so much on the variables that help you cope, but, but on the process. And I try to reference those books so that people can go. A lot of people with job loss, there are books when smart people fail, there are all kinds of other books. Well, I don't feel that my book is the answer to everything, just to three quarters of the That's things. right, just to most of them. But seriously, I want to help people get other books, go to people, uh, go to movies. I mean, there are lots of ways to get help. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, you talked, um, I guess we, we talked about, really we're talking about change in a way, and you haven't had, you've talked about change kind of indirectly, but essentially a change is something that we're all going through all right. the time. Um, what do you see when you talk to people? When you when you when you talk with people, you know, what how, how do, pe do different people react to change? Is it a well? I, I had a woman who called me recently. She said she well, two two women actually. <laughs> One was a pro professor. Now uh, a lot of your viewers aren't going to be academics necessarily, but these are just two people who happen sure. to call. Well, three: a secretary, a professor, and a dean. These are just in the last few weeks. 
One was a professor who's in her 60s who said she read my book and wanted to talk to me. Now, I do not do private clinical work, but I will see people for one interview and then refer them. And she came in because what she was dealing with was that she couldn't, started out with she didn't have time to open her mail, she did not have time to clean her apartment, and she was just overwhelmed. She has two ill parents. She is responsible for them. In addition, there is a lot of trouble with her adult siblings. Uh, so she's getting a lot of flack from her siblings. She has a lot of pressure at work. I mean, the pressures were just, just, you know, overwhelming her. What could she do? I said, well, you came to see me because I wrote the book. Let's sit down and write your four S's. What's your situation? What's your self-supports? And, and what we found that what was really giving her the trouble was that her best friend had deserted her, mm. was tired of all the broken dates. And so what we had to do is help her reframe and realize that right now her situation is very overwhelming. She doesn't know how long it will last, but that she can get some support from her professional group. She goes to a professional meeting once a month. And just to realize she can't make a new best friend right now and to sort of hold off. So we, we went through the process with her. A dean whose college has just been eliminated called me. What does she do, you know, with retrenchment? Uh, a secretary whose job uh, has just been over. So people call all the time for help, and I try to help them look at their change and their resources for coping with it and figure out what they can do to take charge of their lives. And it's comforting. I think for most people to realize that we're all going through change all the time and sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own change that we feel uh, that we're alone and we don't really have any right. resources and don't know how to deal with okay. them so uh, your book sounds like a very good approach well, to I hope uh, so I, I hope it will help some yeah. people it seems to uh, I want to give away what I know in, in psychology. That's really the goal. If there's something that I know or that we know in this field, let's give it away to people. Okay. Let's not keep it such a secret. Yeah. Talk, talk, just tell us once, once more the name of the book oh, and, okay. where they, and where people can get it. Overwhelmed, Coping with Life's Ups and Downs. The hardback, 1695, is a Lex or seven, I forget what it is now, uh, Lexington Books. That can be ordered by bookstores. The paperback, 395, by Dell is probably in most bookstores and if not they can get it right away. Okay. This has been very very interesting and I appreciate you spending time with us. I wish we had more time because I know people would like to hear more about how they can deal with their transitions. You've been watching this edition of Worth Quoting. We've been talking with Dr. Nancy Schlossberg who has shared some very interesting information with us on dealing with the transitions that we face in life. Thank you very much for being with us.